Okay. All right. So um, let me give you a little bit of background for Teresa. Uh, Teresa at the moment is a uh, chancellor's professor of chemistry, bioengineering, and chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. She's also a senior faculty scientist in the chemical sciences division of Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Uh, uh, she's also a, a fellow of the American Chemical Society, the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, and a couple of others. Um, she was born in Akron, Ohio. I won't say the year, <laughs> um, but you can back calculate it if you want to after <laughs> learning that she earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry at Case Western Reserve University in 83. That was followed up by a, uh, a PhD in uh, theoretical chemistry at Carnegie Mellon in 89, she, where she worked with uh, Charlie Brooks. Um, that, after that, she went to Bell Labs in New Jersey and worked with Frank Stillinger from 1990 to 1992 on um, protein folding and uh, water. Yep. And after that, she joined, uh, uh, so that, that brings us to what, 1992? So in 1992, she joined uh, LBNL as a staff scientist and stayed there for about nine years. In 2001, she was uh, awarded the IBM SUR, or SUR Award, for her research in computational biology. That year, she also joined the faculty at Berkeley, um, first being an assistant professor in the Department of Bioengineering, and then she was uh, quickly promoted a few years later in 2004 to associate professor and then to full professor in 2007. And in, in 2011, she then joined the faculty of the Department of Chemistry or Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Berkeley, and in 12, she was appointed chancellor's professor in the Department of Chemistry, and as well as a senior faculty scientist in the Chemical Science Division at LBNL and a member of the Pitzer Center which I remember. Um, so research in Teresa's group is, is fairly broad um, and uh, really is a combination of development of theoretical methods and or theoretical models and computational methods for studying essentially condensed phase systems, but a fairly wide range of those. Um, you know, I, I have been arranging molecular liquids and macro, macro molecular assemblies to biocatalysts and complex interfaces. Um, Good, good, inter good introduction. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> very, very comprehensive. So <laughs> and, uh, we, we have a, we have a, we have a plaque for you too, Teresa. Oh, uh, yay. Oh, thank you. The, uh, the the event. So thank you. It's very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you again for coming to give the, uh, the lectures. Look forward to hearing All that. right. Thank you very much, Rob. I've had a wonderful day today. Thank you, everybody, for um, for the great hosting. And so, um, so today it's going to be more on the chemical physics, physical modeling side. And as Rob said, tomorrow will be machine learning, which is a new kind of area of of what we can do um, in our computational toolbox. But what I also want to talk about is one of my great loves, and that's the discussion about uh, is, is the topic of water. And so um, I feel really quite honored to be um, the Dubai lecturer because um, Peter Dubai's work has essentially influenced quite a lot of some of the things that I've been doing over time. And so I'm going to take you through a little bit of that history, but also just to simply say that water is a perennial subject and it is a, um, a controversial one. It's always something is um, you know heating up and um, becoming a controversy. And so... We'll start with the fact that structure, of course, is our um, is how we often think about interpretation of properties of, of a liquid like water, um, its thermodynamic, its dynamic properties. And what I say in all of its guises, what I mean by is that is that, you know, over all of its phases, over um, its role as a solvent, how things sort of affect chemical reactivity in water. And so, of course, we know that um, Dubai had sort of made these early connections to um, X-ray scattering and to, and, to the, and to the structure factor, and that water structure, of course, is amenable to being studied by that. And so, um, you know, what Dubai showed were that X-rays are scattered by the sinusoidal components of the electron density, and that this has a functional dependence on the momentum transfer. And what you measure, so therefore that's what you do, that's what you experimentally dial in, that's what you measure. And then what you're gonna be able to get out of that is at least one possible interpretation is that there's an effective Bragg spacing. There's some kind of repeat unit. And what I'm showing here are some early um, work that I did in collaboration with experimentalists on um, new liquid diffraction experiments on water. 
Okay, so now what do we know about the structure of water? Well, let's think about hexagonal ice, which is that the way um, these peaks arise, okay, correspond to certain types of Bragg spacings. And for example, what it's thought to be when you sort of back out from the momentum, the peaks of the momentum uh, at the momentum transfer Q, um, like I said, you can use that inverse relationship to give you um, a Bragg spacing, and that Bragg spacing in ice tends to essentially be the center to center distance of, hexa of hexagons in the, in the ice structure. And so what we know then is that liquid water, we observe a change in the Bragg spacing, um, which reduces, and that's probably due to the fact that under thermal um, influence that the uh, fluctuations give rise to sort of changes in the local hydrogen bonded network um, to give you a distribution of, of water neighbor configurations, you know, again, which is sort of seeming this collapse here. And then you can see that if I look at this intensity observable as a function of temperature, I can see that at cold temperatures, this um, second Bragg spacing at about um, two angstroms, you know, sharpens or um, disappears. Um, depending on what the temperature is. And so what are they, so what are these Bragg spacings telling us about water? Um, well, let's come back to some of the foundations that Peter Debye had um, you know, led us to, which is that here is the molecular form factor for gas, gas phase water. And then these are the intermolecular correlations that come out of it. And what we want to get at is this, um, to be able to put it into real space, to be able to, to look at the structure, is to um, look at this structure factor. And the structure factor bears a relationship to the radial distribution function. Okay, so now I don't want to imply that Dubai didn't anticipate the fact that the Dubai approximation is largely arguing that these weighting factors, besides just the sort of the uh, atomic fractions, that these weighting factors scattering power um, is assuming that um, that each that th this is just a collection of independent atoms with spherical electronic charge distributions, which of course we know is a severe approximation. And I'm, again, I want to emphasize: I'm sure Debye was more, you know, had was was working on the structure factor idea and just not worried about these, but knowing that it was an approximation. And so what I'm showing here then are experiments that were done where you can see that um, the, the, the dark, the solid black line corresponds to the experiment and that the independent atom approximation is clearly non-conforming, all in the area of momentum transfer space that I was just describing where all the Bragg space um, peaks are happening. So what my group did was to then develop with these so-called modified atomic form factors. And what they really are doing is just the fact that, you know, these are not independent atoms, but that there's uh, chemical bonding that occurs when you're a water molecule that may, then is going to shift the electron density. And so here is the functional form. So this is the original independent atom approximation modified to account for the gas phase dipole moment. If I was actually just trying to get the molecular form factor, if I was doing the liquid, I would then have to um, assume a larger dipole moment uh, for this term alpha. And then this is a one fit parameter to experiment. And this is what we can see now, the modified atomic form factors give us then very good agreement with the, um, with the molecular form factor for water. All right, so what does that mean? What that means then is that under the Debye approximation, the intensity would now say that the oxygen-oxygen correlations, because that's what it's pretty much dominated by due to Z number, is now under, I'm sorry, under the molecular um, the modified atomic form factor, the oxygen-oxygen correlation comprises now about 85% of the signal as opposed to 60%, 66% under the Debye approximation. And so what we learn from this is that we finally then should be able to maybe extract um, a meaningful radial distribution function, which was really difficult during this time. There was lots and lots of arguments about uh, what this RDF actually looked like. And so ultimately things have settled down um, and this is a, and what we can do is by integrating under the first peak of the oxygen oxygen, we can see that water retains a lot of its tetrahedral structure. In other words, that the coordination number is just above four 
Okay, it's not like a Leonard Jones fluid, okay, with a, with a much larger uh, coordination number. And secondly, you get this strong peak, and this is the so-called tetrahedral signature. Okay, not only the height of this peak was contentious, but also whether water was a tetrahedral liquid was contentious for a while. And that essentially settled down over time. But then water is always controversial. And so what I'm showing again is that now we leave what I was just showing you as wide angle scattering. And now I'm going to talk about small angle scattering, small angle x-ray scattering. And so what we're doing here is we're essentially looking for um, water anomalies. Okay, so water we know has many anomalies, but one of the hypotheses is that there's a second critical point in the in the supercooled region. And what people were trying to do is to essentially look for correlation lengths that were diverging, okay, as you essentially got colder and colder and were trying to approach the critical point. And so um, Nielsen's group at Stanford had actually then proposed the fact that there was a uh, what they were arguing was um, a divergence in the correlation length um, due to the presence of two structural species that they were saying were detectable above the critical point, some kind of pre-transition of a low density and a high density liquid, okay? Now, this is postulated to exist below the critical point, but their argument was that in the small angle X-ray scattering, they could start seeing um, larger and larger length scales that if you then fit the small angle scattering to a model to get the radius of gyration, observations of a low density feature of water that's about, about a nanometer um, in size sitting in a high density liquid background at 25 degrees Celsius. So a two state structural model for water at room temperature, okay? All right. Um, and then as things got colder, they were arguing that these length scales are growing. All right, so we come into the picture again, okay, where again, the structure factor is really the dominant thing that we want to be able to get. And furthermore, we collected this radial distribution function, which at the time were very, very large um, simulations, 32,000 water molecules using a pretty good two-body potential but also doing this in the grand canonical ensemble, okay? So when we do that, what we can do is we can reproduce those same features from experiment. And there's two things that we conclude. The first is that, um, you know, overall, we, what we, I'm sorry, there's one thing I did want to come back to. Um, how do we measure, how do we essentially get this correlation length? We get it out of the so-called anomalous scattering. So what you have to do is to take the total scattering function subtract off what's called the normal component and leaving behind the anomalous signature. And this was due to Ornstein Zernicki. Um, and it turned out that actually Debye had actually derived it independently later in his career. He, he um, uh, didn't realize it, but he did ultimately reproduce the Ornstein Zernicki result as he became interested in uh, dynamic light scattering and other kinds of things. Okay, so the thing is that, so therefore this anomalous scattering. now. Um, so what we did is to first of all say is that we found that there was negligible anomalous scattering. We're at room temperature, okay? We're well above the critical point. And so any anomalous scattering is going to be small and indecipherable. And therefore, um, we would say that this is an inappropriate use of the ornstein zernicki equation, which is really trying to describe these concentration fluctuations, which is if you had two species, for example. And then what we also can see is that if we analyze, so if we can reproduce the experimental observable with our simulations, we can analyze it. And we can see that this is just a homogeneous density. We don't see any bimodality in regards to a low or high density feature. And therefore, um, the, not surprisingly, the correlation length barely increases and it certainly does not diverge, okay? So water, again, is very controversial. Um, there is still this, I mean, you guys, some of you already know it pretty well about the fact that this is, was, a, for a time, the second critical point hypothesis um, was really the rage. And I think overall, uh, we've kind of left it alone and, and we'll see whether that comes back. And so now what I'd like to do is to take you to the current controversy, and that's essentially chemical reactivity in regards water droplets. Okay, so if you spray water, 
you create an interface, an air water interface, an oil water interface, some kind of hydrophobic water interface, then, and you put reactants in it, okay, organic reactions of your favorite sort, you can see that reaction rates actually accelerate relative to the bulk liquid by somewhere between one to eight orders of magnitude, okay? All right, so the question is why? Like there, there, no one, you know, so Graham Cooks um, at Purdue is just literally going through an organic chemistry book and just putting every organic chemistry reaction into a droplet just to get the full catalog, okay, of possible chemical reactions that can occur in these environments and looking at rate accelerations. All right, so the question, and so the question is why? Um, so is there something different about the pH at the surface? Is it just a trivial effect of, you know, these things are evaporating, therefore concentrating reactants, so you're just getting sort of increased collision rates? Um, are there gas phase channels that perhaps are being activated? Um, what is the energy source? Like, where is this energy coming from to be able to drive over the, you, you over the free energy barrier? And so there's the things like cavitation have been proposed, okay? Are all reactions accelerated in the microdroplets? Um, do the mechanisms change? All of these are sort of open questions. And so what we're working on, and so Graham favors this idea of partial solvation, just the idea that the thermodynamics of the reactant in the transition state are different when you're under-coordinated, when your solvent environment is under-coordinated than it is when you're in the bulk and it's fully coordinated. Um, and so there, there's that argument. And we've been sort of pursuing this idea of the fact that there's organization at that interface that give rise to directional and perhaps significant electric fields, okay? And those electric fields are an energy source. All right. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk to you about the latest water controversy in regards to reactivity and microdroplets. I'll sort of highlight the work of Hongsha Hao, who's currently at Microsoft for Science um, in uh, Shanghai, and the electric field work that we have done for water, and Joe Heindel's work, which is actually looking, doing excellent work in actually understanding um, electron transfer okay, in these water droplet systems, because there's a basic reaction, just a basic reaction arguing that these droplets actually yield hydrogen, measurable hydrogen peroxide, okay, on their own without putting anything else in it. All right, we'll come back to that, um, and then we'll also, you know, we have some, uh, some explanation that I think are emerging beyond the electric fields, and that's the fact that these droplets are charged. That makes them different than bulk systems because it's not an ionic strength effect. It's a chart. These droplets have charge. And then finally, we're working with, um, uh, with an experimentalist, Wei Min, at Columbia University, who's developing some new surface sensitive spectroscopy. We have been, uh, I, I don't want to say stuck, but we have been mostly, you know, the field has been mostly using. Uh, vibrational sum frequency generation. And the idea is that, can you get a cleaner spectroscopy to be able to sort of understand what's going on at that interface? Okay, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today and that's done work done by, um, by uh, Alan LaCour. All right, so I, I wanted to then start by just talking a little bit about methods, okay? Just sort of saying, well, how am I gonna actually answer these questions as a theorist? And, um, what I wanted to do was to simply say that all of us who's working in theory in the chemical energy regime are kind of fighting this tension, especially when we're in the condensed phase, right? Which is that, you know, we, this is a famous uh, plot of essentially looking at, um, you know, increased um, good, or better and better approximations to the Schrodinger equation, all through how you model those electron-electron correlations with essentially giving you system sizes that are sort of, you know, hundreds um, probably by today's standards. But there's another statistical, I mean, sorry, there's another physical law that we have to obey, and that's this statistical mechanical rule that there is a high dimensional integration we have to do, which is that if I want to collect any kind of average property in the condensed phase, I have to be able to visit that observable under many, many different configurations okay, weighted by a Boltzmann factor, which therefore means that I've got to evaluate, okay, that energy over and over and over again, 
Okay. Now, so you can see why then people jump to force fields because force fields then, um, and what have been the most popular for a long time are the ones that rely on the two body approximation. And what you get back, what you get back is essentially effectively a change in base, okay, in the system size that you can look at or the time scales that you can sample. And that's why there is this, um, where you get this hope that the many body effects of a real, of the real um, system, the real energy and forces of the system somehow get washed out or captured by effective parameterization. Now, I will say that water is probably an exception in the sense that um, the description of water physics have really reached a very high standard, okay? Paul Houston is involved in one of those efforts, which is QAQUA. Um, MB Pole is another example. Um, and um, what my group has been doing is also to try to move beyond this pairwise additive um, assumption in our force fields. And so we know that it has to be true, okay, which is that we look at, go to, let's go to Anthony Stone's book and we can essentially see that these sort of now may be classified into certain uh, weak or strong interactions, but nonetheless, most force fields don't represent this physics, okay? And, um, and if they do, if, they, if, they, um, or, or if, if the force fields essentially don't represent that physics or only represent some of it, then what they're hoping for, is, as most computational chemistry relies on, is cancellation of error. And if cancellation of error doesn't happen, then you're going to get, then you're going to get problems. Okay, so they typically do it imperfectly. So here um, we had uh, Akshaya and a visiting student, Lars Urban from Germany. What I was just really just showing you here is this original many body potential, the amoeba force field. It's many body comes through um, isotropic polarization. But what it does is it relies on cancellation of error. Okay, so what I'm showing here is that this polarization is clearly, if we look at an energy decomposition, like for example, what Martin's group does, um, that line corresponds to what the decomposed um, energy should look like from, an, from uh, let's say a good quality DFT functional. And the fact that it's off the line is because it's trying to build in all of the missing physics, okay? And therefore is trying to rely on cancellation of error. All right, so MB pole, okay, has decided to take the tack that they'll represent in a physical form um, the permanent electrostatics and isotropic polarization, but they're just going to walk away from the idea of transferability. They're just going to say that we're going to build in all of the short-range anisotropic, highly quantum mechanical effects into very high-level polynomials of two-body and three-body, okay? And those have thousands of parameters associated with them. And there's about 50 times more expensive than the amoeba model, okay? But MB pole is actually very, very accurate. And Paul, I don't mean to leave out Q aqua, but Q aqua is based on sort of four body. Um, and that those are, um, Q aqua is probably even more accurate than this version of MB pole. But what we really wanted to do was to get something that was transferable. Okay, I want to be able to do something beyond just water. But what I'm also trying to say is that we use the energy decomposition analysis to now try to come up with functional forms that are going to handle all of the many body interactions and therefore connect to all the decompositions of the energy. And so we have charge penetration, we have anisotropic polarization, we also have charge transfer, okay? And so what we do then is we try to, um, to have the EDA guide us in regards to how we dial in polarization, how do we dial in charge transfer, et cetera, at the two, three, four, five body level, okay? And at the end of that, we get a force field which has no experimental input, okay? And so this is what you get. So here's the, um, you know, you get uh, the, the temperature of maximum density, very accurately. Heat of vaporization, pretty good, pretty good. Um, it's taking off just a little bit too fast, which means that the heat capacity is going to take off a little bit um, at, low, at, at higher temperatures than it should. Transport's excellent. Radial distribution structure is really very good. 
et cetera. But the key thing is that we want to be able to sort of develop this beyond, okay, um, a water model, but to put stuff in water, okay? And so that's what we're currently at. So I think I kind of wanted to leave you with the message that I think that the days of um, black box, black magic type force field development is over, which is that this is a principled approach to developing force fields that I think is pretty robust. And so the systems are gonna get more difficult. We're gonna run into problems. Certainly functional forms are gonna fail us, et cetera. But I think that you know the, 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 the premise okay, is there and been proven. So never satisfied with a victory, we then turn to reactive force fields, which are the worst of all worlds, okay? Which is that now, not only do I want to get quantum mechanical non-bonded interactions right, I wanna get reactivity right in a force field, okay? So we kind of started off uh, a little bit with these um, bond order potentials. So this is something like Reacts FF. And what you have are these bonded terms um, that, uh, really in some sense have become so heavily parameterized because if you want to describe bond making or breaking, now what you have to do of course is to be able to get the new valence terms right, but also just sort of recognize that you have corrections all over the place. You might be over-coordinated, you might be under-coordinated, you might mistake a lone pair, okay, for a bond. There are all kinds of issues so associated with this. But it was really hard to get down to what was wrong with this part because of the non-bonded terms where what they were using was this EEM method, this electronegativity equalization method. It was their way of essentially accounting for charge rearrangements, okay, that therefore was carrying the load of describing permanent electrostatics, charge transfer, polarization, all in that, all in this case. And it was really rates limiting, really slow. So until you can kind of get some sampling going, it's just very hard to tell where the errors are in the force field were. And furthermore, which is that the EM model is probably not very physical. One gets, for example, large range, long, long range charge transfer, okay, which is clearly wrong. Um, it, it gets sort of, it doesn't fragment um, into integer ions correctly. There's all kinds of problems with it. All right. so. We decided to then try to at least get going by replacing the EEM with a core shell model. Okay, so this was work was done by Itai uh, Levin, and Itai did a, a really a brilliant job, I think. I mean, it's a core shell model, but it was just really kind of inspired by the conceit of being quantum mechanical, like we call it the coarse grain electron model, because what we're going to do is to say that the shells are decomposable from their cores, and therefore they can manifest things like charge transfer or polarization, and that the strength of how close it stays to its core, how polarizable all, all of it is, is going to be controlled by the ionization potential of the core um, or the electron affinity, okay? So the idea was that they had the conceit that it was actually going to behave like the periodic table, okay? I can say in practice that that is a conceit and that actually we had to sort of do some atom typing to get things to work. But um, it turns out that for water, because that's where you always seem to start with new models, is then what we wanted to do was to get um, a way to describe proton transfer. We wanted to be able to describe, um, you know, to have a, um, a dissociative model that at least would do that. Okay, and so we had to sort of fix up some of the bond terms of the REACTS FF. Um, we had to get sort of, you know, refit some of the binding energies. Um, and then ultimately we get a water model that I will say, um, you know, didn't drop out beautifully like an EDA. Okay, this is, this is fit to, we get, a, we get a temperature maximum density. It turns out that once you get the temperature maximum density, it's all downhill from there. And that means that it's easy to get the diffusion coefficient right. And then the key thing is that we've got now the uh, mechanisms of proton transfer where we can, you know, see the eigenzundle, eigen-type mechanism. We can see the hypersolvation of hydroxide. We can see its lower diffusion coefficient relative to the proton. 
and we actually really do see proton transfer um, hopping mechanisms, um, as Grotus um, indicated. All right, so what I wanted to say then stopping here is that this model is what we're going to use to actually describe water droplets. But what we're gonna do is we're really gonna use it as a configuration sampler, okay? So we're not gonna rely on its energetics. We're gonna rely on the fact that it's actually a reasonable model for generating configurations for high level quantum chemistry calculations, okay? All right, that's all right. So here's now with that, Let's turn to this question about what about these electric fields, okay? If I got an electric field and I project it along some reactive bond, can I lower the transition state? If I can lower the transition state, then I'm going to, I'm going to accelerate the reaction. All right, so therefore people want to measure these electric fields. And since it seems like the obvious difference between the bulk and the droplets is an interface, then what are the interfacial electric fields, okay? So, this is an experiment that was done by Wei Min at Columbia, um, along with Dick Zare at Stanford. These are my collaborators, um, and we're on part of a Murray team, um, along with uh, Jahan DeWaltry, as well as Mark Johnson, um, as well as Graham Cooks. And all of us are sort of trying to work together to try to understand why this microdroplet chemistry works. Okay, so this was their first foray into essentially measuring these electric fields. So this is a classic vibrational Stark experiment. There's some kind of probe and they're putting it at the interface and they're actually just sort of seeing how the, the vibrational shift happens. It's ultimately well calibrated. And what they back out is that you get something like 10 megavolts per centimeter. Okay, so to put that into perspective for you, that's not enough to do much chemistry. Okay, that's not going to break a bond you need about another, at least another order of magnitude, okay? But it's still large, it's still relatively large and surprising, but not enough in an explanation in and of itself, okay? All right, so, so what we came along to do then is to, try to, um, is to try to understand what kind of electric fields do you get? Um, what, how can we make sense of this experiment? Okay. So what I'm showing here is then here's our coarse-grained electron model reacts FF simulation where we've got hydroniums and hydroxides in there. We've got charge balance. This is about a, a 40 angstrom, right, um, diameter, I'm sorry, radius. So it's about an 80 angstrom diameter. So it's a nano droplet. But what we can see is that if we look at the charge density, we see these fluctuations that occur um, this is actually starting outside of the interface, and this is essentially when you get into about five angstroms beneath that surface, you're bulk-like, okay, in regards to the charge density. It just zeroes out. All right, now, there was a, there has been a long problem in the field from the experiment, which is that if one tries to just take a slab geometry, okay, just do a little box with an AIMD calculation, one actually predicts that the surface potential, okay, is about uh, three to th three to five um, megavolts, okay, or volts. Um, okay, so that's what, and, and it's positive. Okay, that's actually implying that the electric field is doing this into the droplet, okay, by the chemistry convention, not the physics one. And then classical models literally have, an, have, a, have the opposite sign. It's qualitatively different. It's saying it's pointing in this direction. And furthermore, the magnitude is, is much smaller. And so with our reactive force field, what we get is essentially that um, is something that is the same side as AIMD, but just not quite as large. And I can sort of tell you why I think, uh, why I know that that's the case. Um, the first thing to say is that this has real, this is a Gaussian potential. It's got real electron density, okay? That's not what you have in a classical model. You have point charges. And because of that, you do not have a probe of what's called the mean inner potential. So that's essentially therefore necessary. So the sign has to be positive because that's what real electron density looks like. But the other reason why this is wrong is because the, it's a finite size effect. With a small box, if you, there's two ways to calculate the electric field. You can put a grid, okay, and just integrate over the surface and back out an electric field, an average electric field, 
or you can take this, you can calculate the surface potential and then take the derivative. And that derivative is also equal to the electric field. And if it turns out that with AIMD, those two things don't agree, okay, which I might sort of suspect is a finite size effect. Whereas with our big enough, okay, 80, you know, angstrom droplet, those that finite size effect is gone and those consistency in those two calculations. Okay. All right. So now the thing that's most interesting is that, you know, we're, we're doing statistical mechanics. This, this is a um, dynamical object that's fluctuating. It's got statistical fluctuations. We do something called the, uh, the, the Willard Chandler interface, which is really describing, okay, those density fluctuations um, of what defines the interface. And when we do that, what we find is that we probably rather gratuitously, um, uh, maybe not believably, get an average that's very, very close to that experiment that Wei Min and Dick Zer did. But that's not what's interesting. What's interesting is the fact that this is not Gaussian. Okay, those, those electric field fluctuations, okay, have a Lorentzian shape. What is a Lorentzian? Lorentzian's got really, really, really long tails, which means that you've got real probability, okay, of generating field strengths that are high enough to do chemistry. Okay. All right, and so that means that I could then, I could sort of say, okay, let's ask this. So let's just take the fact that we know that there's dangling OH bonds at the surface of air water. Let's just project the electric fields, okay, at the, um, on, those o, on those free OHs, okay? I'm not gonna treat the transition state electric field different from the reactant state, so just pull that out. But what I got is a difference dipole, okay? And the difference dipole between the transition state and the reactant state is a very reasonable, okay, change of about 25%, yeah. And if I do that, then I get a free energy lowering that's about two kcals per mole with that projection, okay, and there was the idea that I projected onto the OH bond a certain component of that of that Lorentzian electric field, and that makes sense to me, right? That's two orders of magnitude. So these aren't enzymes, okay? They're not doing 25 orders of magnitude. They've got modest acceleration, somewhere between 10 to 10 to the six, something like that. So with this thought experiment, the idea is that um, you can, you could, for example, um, accelerate uh, the breaking of that OH bond, uh, or at least um, stretching it um, with that free energy lowering. And like I said, the wider wings, okay, of these E fields means that, that you increase the odds for chemical bond breaking. And furthermore, that it's an electrospray process, which is that you've got lots and lots and you've got gazillion droplets, okay? So all of them are fluctuating, which means that this whole probability is being sampled, okay? And that means that chemical reactivity is very, 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 very possible. All right, so that's our electric field story, but now let's continue to this question of this H2O2 debate, okay? So it turns out that this is quite contentious in the literature right now. And there's, there's all these different ways that you can, there's these four main ways of creating do droplets, okay? So one, what you can do is you can uh, just heat up water and create vapor, okay? Then, you're, then you've got this mist up here. Um, it supposedly runs a reaction. You'd be able to condense it back down onto the cold surface, collect the result to see how much H2O2 you have, okay? So that's, that's, what, that's the hypothesis is that there's an unusually high, or there's some, some production through some kind of electron transfer process that's creating OH radicals to create H2O that then diffuse and find each other to create hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so therefore it could come from that kind of droplet. This is called gas nebulization. And so the idea is that water is being shot through some tube, you got some gas, it could be N2, O2, and it's breaking up the water. Okay, and it's essentially creating droplets. Now it's also undergoing what's called contact electrification. That means that you know this process is so violent that as water is breaking up, it's also stripping off okay uh, electrons. 
at the same time. And that's called contact electrification. That's something we see in our everyday life, okay? Lightning is responsible for contact electrification, um, et cetera, et cetera. Contact electrification is responsible for lightning. So the thing is that that's, um, that's another droplet. And then this is called sonication. And so you just do it at a certain frequency and this naturally creates droplets, okay? And then you do electrospray, okay? So these are the four favorite methods. All right, so the problem is that Dick Zare's group essentially claimed that he could get hydrogen peroxide in all these cases, okay? Now, other experimentalists came along and um, what they were able to show is that this guy does not, okay? It's below the detection limit. If it's there, it's not something that you can quantify, okay? But the sonication method gives you something that is obviously above the limit of detection and therefore measurable, and therefore the hydrogen peroxide could form okay, from these droplets. Now, the other problem is that Dick's group claimed that he was getting 100 micromolar. Okay, if you're not getting 100 micromolar, you're getting about one, but it is detectable. And as far as I'm concerned as a theoretician, if they've got a measurement that has been reproduced by two independent groups and they essentially measure something that is real, then I think there's a reason to, we want to go and explain this thing. Okay, all right, so, so the question is that, why, why would this not happen? Why is this so unbelievable? Why is this contentious? It's because trying to liberate an electron from OH minus, okay, that's about nine EV. Okay, that's a big energy. Okay, if you, if you take it from water, it's 12 EV. EV. All right, so this, this is the rate limiting step right here. Where's the energy source? Like, how can this happen? Okay, so, um, so it turns out that John Herbert um, actually published this paper, which he calls the banality of the air water interface in regards to reactivity. Okay, so what he's going to do is he's going to measure vertical ionization energies. And when he and so what he chose is a bunch of ions. So he chose chloride, chose a bunch of halogens. Um, but here's chloride. And what he sees is that the vertical ionization energy, it doesn't matter whether it's at the interface or whether it's in the bulk. Um, it's pretty much the same distribution in both cases. Okay, you don't get any difference and hence the banality, okay? And so what we did is to then take our configurations from that, from that micro droplet or that nano droplet, um, we put chloride in and we can um, excise out of it um, a cluster of about 20 water molecules, a couple of solvation shells around the chloride. And then we're gonna do electrostatic embedding because we have the whole droplet, right? So we've got partial charges so the idea is that we should be able to then get a good high quality electrostatic embedding. And what we get is then we, we reproduce John's result. We get um, an ionization and a vertical ionization energy that's really pretty, pretty in pretty good agreement with experiment, okay? And, it, and the thing is that here's the Gibbs dividing surface. And so not surprisingly, you're under coordinated out here, but it doesn't matter, okay? Which is, it doesn't matter if you're under coordinated, you're hyper coordinated, the vertical ionization energy just is, is just large, okay, whether you're at the interface or not. Okay, but what John didn't do is that he didn't do hydroxide ion, okay, and it turns out that that's a completely different story, okay? So we do the same calculation, and what we can see is that the experiment, okay, for hydroxide from photoelectron spectra is about 207, and when we average over this main peak, we get something in very good agreement. But what we see is a new population, and that new population is coming at the, from the interface. Okay, it's under-coordinated. If it's under-coordinated, essentially the vertical ionization energy drops. Okay, all right. Um, in a way, this is not too surprising, because if I looked at the vertical ionization energy of gas phase water, that's about maybe two and a half, EV, and so the fact that it's just at the interface makes a lot of sense, okay, that you would be able to liberate electrons a lot easier, okay? Well, where is that energy gonna come from, okay? Still, it's still a large energy, two EV. 
So what if I integrate those electric fields over the interface of about a nanometer, then I have a finite probability of matching those energy scales. In fact, I need to be something like, it's about 40 or 50% probable. If I'm out here just a little bit past the mean into the wings, um, still therefore highly probable, I can reach about 50 megavolts per centimeter. 50 megavolts per centimeter matches that energy scale when I, when I multiply that by a nanometer interface. Okay. All right. So therefore that's explanation two is that the interface, the electric field at the interface um, can drive chemical reactivity. All right. And now we'll come back to another mystery. What about all this redox chemistry that we're seeing in these droplets? Okay. And the thing that I want to emphasize is that out of those four ways that I told you how you can make droplets, um, three of them give you charged droplets, okay? You don't, with that heating and cooling, you don't get any charged droplets. But remember, contact electrification for gas nebulization. Sonication gives you charged droplets. And of course, le electrospray does as well. And that's different than just increasing the ionic strength of a bulk liquid. So that's the next distinction that what makes a droplet different, okay, than bulk is the fact that it can carry charge. All right. Now, in this electron, you know, this oxidation reduction, which is just actually asking, um, you know, the hydroxide, hydroxyl radicals and the solvated electrons, you know, like therefore this barrier, which is all enthalpic, it's free energy, entropy is negligible. Okay, but the enthalpy is what's, is what's killing it, and it's essentially thermodynamically, how do you explain the fact that this is just a large barrier, okay, to create that radical? All right, and so Joe developed this thermodynamic cycle. It turns out that Bill Goddard's group had actually developed it, and what we want is we want to get this quantity here. We want to ask, how does the, um, how does the hydration, okay, of this and this, okay, which is this is the more stable species, change has I create more charge. So this superscript N is saying I've got minus two, minus three, minus four excess charge. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use the same quantum mechanical model. The statistical mechanics comes from the CGEM, reactive CGEM model. And now we're going to do not only permanent electrostatics, but we're going to embed that in a continuum model to get polarization. Okay, so now we think we have a pretty good model for essentially evaluating all of these individual quantities to back out this hydration free energy and then ask the question, what, what number of ions, okay, do I actually um, exceed um, this thermodynamic barrier? Okay. All right, so what I'm showing here then is that, um, you know, this is what's happening in these droplets, right? Which is that they don't have to break evenly, right? They, they, they're, this is sort of how electrospray, for example, or contact electrification might look like, is that these droplets are breaking up and one can have electron transfer within the droplets or between the droplets. Those are all possible mechanisms. We're not really commenting too much on this other than to say, that um, when there are eight hydroxides, okay, we measure a shift in the hydration free energy to be more stable, okay, for, uh, or another way to put it, less stable for the hydroxide ion, okay, that's 63.7, okay, so 64, in addition to adding eight hydroniums, which shifts it, okay, by 57, and then that clearly is a total shift saying that um, the, th the thermodynamics of this process have been well exceeded, okay, with that amount of charge. And that is well below the Rayleigh limit. So the Rayleigh limit is when you've got so much charge that the droplet has to break up. But this is well below the Rayleigh limit um, for these droplets. Okay, we then, um, so therefore this redox chemistry really is spontaneous. Okay, it's spontaneous um, when you have charge. Okay. Um, so the last thing I want to, the, the other thing I do, I'm not going to show here is that we actually then developed a theory that takes us from the nanoscale to the microscale. And that the theory essentially shows that this process just gets even easier, okay, at the micro, microscale limit. 
Let's go back and look at those vertical ionizations or equivalently, um, you know, the VAEs um, has, I, um, has I increased the charge. All right, so what we can see is that remember before when I was showing you those vertical ionization energies, we got those tails. But now when I've essentially add more and more ions, I'm just shifting that so that effectively electrons can just nearly become unbound, okay, with o in, in, in a charged droplet um, for OH minus, okay, and therefore this is this is mirrors um, the vertical electron affinity. All right, now if I actually looked at this shift, and there was essentially as I add charge, I'm going to shift in essentially how easy it is to liberate the electron, and Dubai comes back again. And so what I wanted to show here is that this is measuring the shift in the, and it doesn't matter if it's the VIE or the VEA, if I just plot that as, a, as you know, one over the inverse of R, okay, then I get something, okay, that really this is just Coulomb's law. And what I get is a universal dielectric constant, okay? Down here, there's, this is just not a, a ch enough charge to be on the thing. So this is not enough charge to do anything. But once I get into these sort of regimes of charge, um, which again is well below the Rayleigh limit, what I can see is that this is just well fit to a Coulomb energy with a dielectric constant of one, approximately one, whether it's hydronium or hydroxide. And so we were kind of going back and forth with the reviewer and the reviewer said, well, what do you mean? Like, what are you comparing it to, okay? Are you comparing it to the electronic process? which means are you comparing it uh, to the 1.8, okay, uh, component of the dielectric constant for bulk water, or are we talking about molecular responses? Now, we thought it was molecular. We thought, no, this is dielectric saturation. This is what Debye said, um, that, you know, the, that most of the dielectric constant of water comes through the molecular response, right, from the dipole correlations that respond and what we can see is that it's fully saturated, okay? It's fully saturated, and it's coming down from 80 down to one um, with these charged droplets. And as far as we're aware, there really isn't any extension of Debye's theory to charge, to charge droplets. We don't really have a corresponding um, uh, theory. Now, we have a person in the audience who um, did something quite interesting. Well, um, so, so let me just sort of finish off this, um, this point here by saying that our MD simulations, I, we think, encodes the dielectric screening. The idea is that the waters, you know, are, you know, in the presence of these embedded charges are just poorly screened now. They're just, there's no response left and that that's all encoded. So we do the electronic structure calculation on top of it, why this fits to one is because the molecular response is completely gone. Okay, that's all embedded in the simulation. All right, now this person in the audience here um, had actually sort of also pointed out that dielectric saturation, kind of the, a new kind of interpretation of it is that it's just a loss of dipolar correlations in water, okay? But think about it, which is that we've got, so the, you were doing this for salts, right? And what we've got is an interface. So we've got two things going on. We've got the effect of charge and we've got the effect of the interface that are really breaking up the dipolar correlations to a point where there's just no, nothing left. Okay, there's no dipolar correlations. Those have all been destroyed by the combination of charge and by the combination with the interface. Okay, so there's some theory left to do, to do there. All right, and then um, I'm going to uh, finish off uh, Rob, am I out of time? Okay, I'm, yeah, I see. Okay, um, so so this is work that I'm doing with Lai Shu, who is currently an assistant professor at Fudan University with Wei at, at Columbia. And what they're doing is something called um, solute-correlated Raman spectra. Okay, so it's a in-situ uh, way to measure interfaces. And it turns out that Dor Ben Amitz's group had actually developed this technique um, for um, small solutes to look at the hydration shell. All right, so what I want you to do is to look at the following. So in yellow is that's just the Raman spectra of bulk water, 
Okay, and that peak right there, that shoulder right there, is signature of tetrahedral order. Okay, and it turns out that when when um, Dora does this on small solutes and looks at the hydration shell, he sees that that tetrahedral order increases. Okay, that looks really increased in a small solute case. But when Wei and Lai Shu developed this apparatus to be able to look at oil emulsions, okay, what they see is a total decline. There is a qualitative change, an emergent mesoscale feature, okay, that's unlike the molecular scale. So the decline of the shoulder, so that's what's shown here in blue. And furthermore, you got this something hiding underneath here, and then the question is, is that the free OH peak? Because after all, it's at the, it's at the oil water interface. All right, all right, so that's cool. And so we've been working with them from the beginning. And the thing is, Sylvie Roki's group has been using these vibrational sum frequency generation and coming up with all kinds of arguments about what you know is going on at the interface, which we don't agree with, but that's okay. I'm just really just trying to say that this is a difficult experiment because you can never compare it to bulk, right? You can't because it's just a surface experiment. And therefore that means that you don't really have any reference, but here we actually do. And so there's something to be learned here. All right, so here's, an, here's our oil water system. Here we're using very simple force fields, but here's the oil water interface. And the thing is that many, maybe some of you know, which is that oil droplets are known to carry charge, okay? Which is that if you put, if you have an oil emulsion and you apply an electric field, it will go to the anode Okay, because that, it, so it transports. And, it, and people don't know why. So it has a negative zeta potential. No one knows why. It's a fundamental question that's been around for 100 years, still hasn't been answered, um, but nonetheless is known to be true. All right, so then this idea that how we're going to, you know, we know that this Raman is a reporter for some, for things about this interface. And so what I'm showing here is, is the famous, um, you know, De, De Benedetti Arrington order parameter for tetrahedral um, has a, you know, for um, uh, this is just sort of a, this is a, a correlation function, but we also sort of see it for electric fields that has the temperature, okay, um, has the, as things uh, change, the tetrahedral, tetrahedral order parameter decreases, has temperature increases because presumably the hydrogen bonded network is getting more disordered. And this is sort of how Raman spectra have been interpreted for a long time, okay, which is that the rise um, of, of this peak, okay, um, and the uh, and and the, and the versus this one is a measure of this decline of this intensity is is measured at lower wavelengths is thought to be sort of signs of of that disorder, okay. So so we can do that. We can run that simulation. Here are two order parameters. Water is undercoordinated, so maybe this four nearest neighbor one is different than the three, but it's the same message, which is that we see that as we get to the interface, that the, the order parameters decline, indicating more disorder at the oil water interface, which is opposite to what Sylvie Roki says, which is that it's more ordered. All right, so we developed this new Raman theory, and so this is a big credit to Alan. The idea is that we're going to do a monomer field model. And so the monomer energy surface is then fit to all distortions with the CCSD parenthesis T energy. We can do that perfectly, the monomer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to model the environment as a field-dependent stretch and bend term. Okay, and this is, this is the functional form. And so the parameters, first of all, are used to fit Badger's rule. And from this, from what emerges from our monomer field model is um, the fact that the Fermi resonance is what's responsible, okay? What happens is that the, that peak, that, that shoulder that we see is essentially an overtone from the bend, okay? And then as you uh, change the temperature or change the interface, you move off resonance and that's what causes the shoulder to decline. And so this has been argued about a lot too, okay, about the origin of this. Jim Skinner's group has a different interpretation we actually get this, um, uh, we agree that it's Fermi resonance. And that's what we get. So here's our electric fields and, and we're, we're putting it into the monomer field model. And this is the theoretical spectra and this is the experimental spectra for Raman. Okay, we get very good agreement. 
which means that we can now do the solute correlated spectra. Okay, so the thing is electric fields are weaker. Okay, here's the electric field distribution. As I increase the temperature, the electric fields are getting weaker and this is causing uh, weakened hydrogen bonds, losing Fermi resonance with the bend overtone. All right, so, um, okay, so that's what we see. And then we can do the same subtraction. So all it is is a subtraction experiment. I do an oil water emulsion, I subtract off bulk water until I um, stop before I get negative intensities. All right, and so that what we see is that we get this increase in the free OH and a decrease in the shoulder. All right, so the electric fields at the interface are just weaker. The thing is more disordered. Uh, we lose Fermi resonance. But what we have in the theory right now is this peak, okay? And it's, and it's blue shifted by 80 wave numbers compared to experiment. Okay, actually it's supposed to be blue, sh it's our free OH is blue shifted compared to experiment. And that's where the zeta potential comes in, which is that apparently the oil is introducing an additional electric field, okay, that pushes that free OH in. And what we can do is we can say, well, what is that um, shift? It's about 80 wave numbers. We can use Stark tuning rates, or we can use what Phil Geisler used as a type of scaling parameter telling us that the electric fields at the oil water interface are about 30 to 50 megavolts per centimeter. All right, guys, you guys have been troopers. I'm gonna stop here by saying, um, you know, I think that in these kinds of questions, uh, quantum and statistical mechanics are equally important. Reactive force fields um, are becoming very principled, but reactive force fields are still in their infancy. We're kind of relying on this model right here, right now for reactive, chemistry, in particular proton transfer type stuff, and that the story on microdroplets is, is really developing. We think that it's the combination of an interface with oriented high electric fields, um, and the fact that the droplets carry charge are the explanation behind the um, our observation of chemical reactivity. And all of that's also this, then combining with these new experiments with Wei Min's group. And I'm gonna end by really, I have a fantastic group. I really do. I'm very lucky. I mostly highlighted the work of Joe and Alan today. Um, and um, here we are, and then my colleagues. And also to thank the funding sources. And I'd like to thank you very much for your patience and for listening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, for a great talk. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. I had a question about the release of the valencia scope uh, field versus probability. Is it related to the time scale of fluctuation? Yes, actually, it is. It turns out that it's the it's the coupling of the um, intramolecular. Um, an intermolecular charge transfer is what um, I understood from Greg Bo's group. Um, is what and so they, they see those Lorentzian fields all the time. Okay. Oh, the time scale. I mean, oh, well, so I mean, just the time scales of configurational changes. So probably on the order of picoseconds. You know, because nature of the hydrogen bond being about a picosecond, I would say it's probably on that time scale. If I did what? Say it again. Oh, I see. Well, I mean, if you made it broader at the peak, then you would be more concentrated at lower electric fields and therefore less chemical reactivity. It's the long tails where the electric fields are highest, which is drive, which is what you need to drive chemistry. Okay. Yeah. So the electric field distribution on this in question, it seems to me what matters is not just the time scale for the electric field fluctuations, but the time scale relative to the electron transfer reaction. Because if 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 they fluctuate fast compared to the, to the electron transfer reaction, then they won't change anything. They have to they have to fluctuate slowly so that when you fluctuate to a big E field, the reaction has to quickly. Otherwise, you just you just create that time. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that I, 
what I'm trying to say, it's an ingredient that goes into the chemical reactivity, but the whole mechanism of, and all the things that we're talking about now, I, I can't say. But what I can say is that even though I haven't done the statistical analysis, remember we have all of those droplets, right? So I'm just trying to say that there's also just a statistical probability that I haven't even been able to quantify that says that sometimes those time scales are met just based, just not based on a statistical number of droplet argument. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. I mean, it's gonna be a distribution too, right? It's gonna be some kind of um, uh, time scale distribution. And so I'm just saying that, you know, not everything is sort of an average. Well, but you need the, the overall rate for the ensemble to show it. I know, but I'm, but I guess what I'm just trying to say is that remember, an ensemble average is not the whole, that's the whole point of the electric field distribution is that the ensemble average is not the whole story, right? Tom? Sorry. I, I just wondered this uh, new phenomenon on the world of double circuits. Now, and for reaction, for this reason, that happens in solid to particles that are different I wonder if there is sort of an inverse. I'm sorry, we're talking about solid, which I'm not sure, sure I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Hydrophobic. Yeah. But now you have a solid particle inside. Oh. And the reaction oh. happening in the solid particle. It's sort of the reverse water droplet. Yeah. And I wonder whether the similar phenomenon will play a role. I don't know. I don't know. Could could be. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. All right, now let's have the speaker yeah. again. Okay. <laughs> okay.